Welcome from Stanford University. I'm Bill Barnett, professor at the Stanford Door School of Sustainability and the Stanford Graduate School of Business. And uh, we have with us here today, Professor Yewan Kim from the marketing group here at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. And Yewan, you just had a conference on marketing for environmental sustainability and you ran the conference last year on that topic. How did it go this year? Um, thanks for having me, Bill, first of all. And it was great. So it was great in so many different ways because A, as you mentioned, I could doc I could I could witness how it how the field has changed in terms of engagement and sustainability as a topic over time. So last year we had like a good group of people discussing about the topic, but that that, that year the purpose was to sort of build a community to begin with and then have this discussion like being started but mm -hmm. this year it was more about having a bit more in-depth conversation on the topic with like deeper dives on um uh, very specific questions so it was it was such a great pleasure for me to even like witness as an academic citizen to see how the field was going towards sustainability. Well, that, that's great to hear. What were some of those questions that you heard people discussing and that the papers uh, researched? Yeah, so there were plenty, including uh, like how the government should regulate different firms to achieve the energy efficiency, um, uh, and also uh, how consumers react to these different messages about sustainability, including recycling, uh, organic based uh, wastebands, and things like that. So it just covered a wide range of topics. My goodness! So marketing folks looking at government regulation. Mm -hmm. So what what uh, what what did you all find on that topic? So we actually had two papers on that. The first one by Fiori Anglu at UT Austin and his, her co-authors, they actually looked at whether organic waste bans had any effect on reducing the actual waste amount. Huh. And in the interesting and the most exciting part was that they actually didn't find any good data source to even tackle that question. So they themselves just like went out to the field calling a bunch of different state officials and government agencies to start collecting the data and then from scratch, literally. So they compiled the biggest, largest data set on organic space, organ, uh, waste amount um, by different types, like compostable, non-compostable, things like that, by different states um, over, over the years. So that data collection effort, that itself was like worth to be applauded uh, um, to begin with. And then what they found was super striking and interesting, which was, they actually did not did not find any effect on the reduction of organic waste due to the organic waste bans in most states, except for Massachusetts. So they were actually having this discussion about what was so different in Massachusetts that, you know, like made this made this organic waste ban like so effective. And then they found suggestive evidence that it was related to the enforcement. So. Uh -huh. Um, other than other than in Massachusetts, in other in most other states, there were not many enough like officials to actually enforce these rules, and also there were not many compost. Um, how do you say like compost stations? Uh, let's yes, say yes. So, like since these companies didn't have different outlets to put these organic waste bans. Um, they just like didn't. They almost chose like not to follow the regulations that were that was not enforced at all. So it was like such an interesting, but also kind of like you know mind blowing um, conclusion. And then it just got like a lot of heated discussions. Well, yeah. that's very applicable too because uh, so when we're setting up policies in general, we'll have to make sure that we have enforcement and really the execution side as well as the policy which always gets all the attention exactly and then the other paper that was presented was uh, by our own juan carlos in economics department here at stanford gsb so his and uh, his co-authors and himself looked at how effective this energy regulation that was um enforced on the chinese conglomerates so there were two phases in that regulation. The, in the first phase, that energy regulation was only enforced to um, like a subset of big conglomerates, let's say top 100 only. And then they later expanded to that to top 1,000 
um, conglomerates. And then they're looking at whether there were, were any sort of unintended consequences of the policy. And turns out that these conglom this conglomerates were like smart enough to actually reallocate some of the production to those unregulated smaller size companies that these parent conglomerates owned. So that regulation, although kind of uh, that regulation, despite this like really hard enforcement on the top hundred or top thousand companies, it has some you know spillover effects to uh, the non-regulator side, net regulated side, which made the actual effective size of policy a little smaller than the nominal effective size. I effect see. Size. I see. And and these were environmental policies. Yes. Yes. So, so if if I understand this right, then if we were measuring something like a scope one mm -hmm. compliance, mm -hmm. it would look like the policies were effective. And and for you listeners, you may know this, but scope one is where you're actually looking at the activities of the organization itself. Um, whereas for scope three compliance, that would include upstream and downstream firms. Would this be caught in scope three, or is it even more distant than that? This out essentially, they're outsourcing their environmental bads, if I'm hearing you. So yeah, the, the context was a little different because it first took place in China, and then the regulation was really about regulating the amount of energy to be consumed by individual company. Uh, so if we think about like a, like steel production industry, for example, I see. Um, they kind of regulated only those top steel producers. And then what happened as a consequence was that these conglomerates that actually owned not just the big steel production producer, but also like small and more local producers, they reallocated this production to the smaller ones in the same industry I so see. that they actually didn't have to cut their energy um, usage. Interesting. So in that sense, no scope, scope one, scope two, scope three, this would miss this would miss this. Yes, but as actually, I think uh, there is like a good uh, good link between what you just discussed discussed as like scope one versus scope three, and then uh, the finding of this paper. I mean, we can expect sort of sort of similar balloon effect, right? So if you regulate one part really hard, then we might expect that you know other parts are not affected. This regulated part will only reduce energy consumption or any kind of sustainability, like enhance any sustainability measure. But what what like what actually happens in the market is that these companies are actually strategically reallocating some of their resources to get away with some of the cost levied by these enforcement. You know, as I put the two papers together that you just discussed, I can imagine uh, a real problem here, right? Because you could have you could come away from the second paper saying, well, let's make sure that policies apply to firms across the board, mm -hmm. but you'd also then have to have an enforcement across the board mm -hmm. because otherwise this balloon effect, mm -hmm. I think of it as a whack-a-mole, I don't know, but you know, <laughs> it's going to pop up somewhere else. Right. That would happen on enforcement as, as, as well. Yes. That was my own takeaway from the, those two papers. Yes. That's, that's interesting. Um, so you were talking earlier about some, uh, another paper that had some findings on uh, behavior. Do you want to talk about that one? Yes, yeah, sure. So one paper by Megan Hunter uh, at Boston University and her um, co-authors, uh, it was looking at what types of messages are effectively reducing cross-contamination contamination of uh, trash and recyclable um, items. So it's a huge issue that, you know, a lot of people just put this like uh, non-recyclable recyclable items to the recycling bins, hoping that it at some point will become recyclable. So there is even a term called wish cycling that oh, creates goodness. a lot of cost on the recycling side as well, because, you know, if the entire, if, if, one recycle level, one recycling bin actually has one non-recyclable item in that bin. Uh, it's likely to, it's likely that the entire bin actually goes to the waste. Oh so yeah, because of that one trash item, the entire recycling bin becomes contaminated. That's why, that's where this term contamination is coming from. Oh so goodness. people, although people are willing to recycle because of their kind of uninformed behavior or uninformed choices, um, their behavior actually leads to higher social cost by reducing recyclable items and then increasing trash. So that's a big issue um, these days. And city, uh, one county, I, I believe in Massachusetts, they tried out different messaging to households. Uh, and in one messaging, they said, 
uh, they specified all the recyclable items as like images. So you can put like plastic bottles in it, you can put um, like uh, cardboard boxes in it, so on and so forth. But in other, another scheme, they actually um, specified that these items are not recyclable. So for example, in, Massachusetts, in, in that county specifically, black plastic is not recyclable because it actually can it, it can break down the recycling machine because of the color. So the recycling machine encodes these like different colors, and then that is used to um, um, put you know recycling items separately from this trash. But because uh, for that reason, um, this black plastic is not supposed to go to plastic bins. But but of course, like a lot of consumers put their you know, black plastics, like after having some food to go, just into a rec recycling bin. So they also tested out these different messages saying like, these are not recyclables. And then turns out these more negative message um, is, uh, not only um, reduces the contamination rate, but also keeps the recycling behavior the same. Mm -hmm. So one sort of, one thought that a lot of researchers had was like, what if this negative message is actually you know, discourage this entire recycling behavior to begin with because of like some psychological reasons, right? But they, in fact, do not find any negative effect of those negative messages, but only positive effect on reducing contamination rates. Oh, that's that's really interesting. So, so Yewon, thinking about everything that came up at the conference, what surprised you the most in terms of the different findings or ideas that people discussed? Um, I would say two things. First, I only touched this point briefly when I talked about the first set of papers. The first point is that there are not many great data sources that can be used by academic researchers, even if they have all these great questions to study. Mm. So going back to this like uh, organic waistband papers, like they actually didn't have any good data set on waste, like any kinds of waste, and that's the fact. Um, and also uh, this paper about recycling messages, these uh, team of researchers, they actually went um, out to the field checking every single recycling bin and trash bin by themselves, like um, like on their own, like and checking whether or not any recycling bin was contaminated with any trash after these messages were distributed. So that data collection effort was really amazing too. It was inspiring, um, definitely, but also it sheds light on this like um, urgent need to have uh, collect better data sources um, to tap into this sustainability related question. Mm, so absolutely, and that's here in the United States. States, I wonder worldwide, it might even be more of, of an issue, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, absolutely. And the second uh, point is sort of related to the first point, And that is that there are so many questions that we think we might have an answer, but we still don't have an answer of. So for example, there was a paper by Max Pahali and his co-authors about the impact of animal welfare claims on meat product choices. So they, they were using this exogenous policy variation in which uh, these retailers sort of came up with a unified labeling system of animal welfare. And then before and after that label uh, system adoption, how consumers change their product choices within this meat substitute uh, meat product category. and. And I was I, I I actually had a chance to discuss the paper as a discussant. And when I first got that paper, I thought, hmm, like I'm sure there must be some other papers out there which was tr like trying to tackle this idea of like quantifying, you know, how the consumers will pay, pay for higher animal welfare. Turns out there was none. So hmm. it was really interesting to me to uh, to realize that these like almost like seemingly fundamental, very basic questions on sustainability are still to be answered, uh, which is partly due to the lack of data set, um, which I pointed at earlier. Well, that's incredibly interesting. And, you know, I know for a lot of our listeners, the uh, the idea that you and your colleagues are researchers and marketing and sustainability, those those almost seem completely different worlds. You know, marketing, we think about selling more stuff. You know, sustainability, we think, but what I'm hearing here is a real focus on a qualitative change in the nature of consumption that might be brought about by smarter marketing messaging. Is that fair to say? Yeah, yes and no. And then uh, by no, I mean that 
we define as researchers, like we define marketing as a slightly broader concept than what you just described. So anything that is about close interaction between among government companies and consumers, we think of those problems as marketing. Ah, interesting. So that's why regulations can be become like a marketing question to us because it's it governs like how firms react to those government regulations. Ah, of and then that input will definitely enlighten policymakers to design better policy. So that's my note part. But my answer mostly was yes, because it is indeed like quite important for us to have like a re really accurate understanding of how consumers respond to these different sustainability related information for example like do they actually even like sustainability they all they like they all say that they like sustainability but do do we really find that evidence in real purchase data mm -hmm. so that is some like kind of step zero question that we marketing researchers have to have a great uh, have a good answer of and then we are actually accumulating more and more evidence that suggests that not every consumer likes sustainability. That's interesting. So sustainability is no longer a vertical quality, which is, you know, like, which has unanimous consensus on, you know, like in terms of people's um, preferences, but it's more of like a horizontal differentiation, meaning some people like sustainability quite a lot, whereas some people actually don't like sustainability. Wow. Do we know why? Do we know what the, what the factor is that distinguishes the folks who like sustainability from the folks who don't? Yeah, so there is one psychology paper that kind of sparked a lot of follow-up empirical papers uh, that talked about how consumers make this implicit trade-off between sustainability feature and the performance quality. So if you see a laundry detergent that has sustainability-related claims on top of it, people almost assume that, oh, then that laundry detergent might not be as effective, not might not be as powerful as non-sustainable items. So because of that trade-off, some people actually like non-sustainable items even more because they they put a lot higher weight on that performance aspect compared to sustainability. Oh, aspect. that's interesting. That's uh... Um, you know, just just understanding that could help us go a long way to maybe reframing the way we talk about exactly more sustainable products. Exactly. And this is anecdotal, and then there is no academic research on this. But if you think of a Tesla, I mean, we all know that EV is like, you know, like reducing carbon emission, like compared to um, these like traditional gasoline cars. But if Tesla promoted themselves as eco-friendly brand to when they first came out to the market, would they actually um, have faced the same market share as they do right now? Mm. Uh, because Tesla, they like their brand positioning was not really around environmental sustainability when they came out to the market. It was all about quality, like performance, like this technology innovation, right? And then, like as a side, almost like no, no, as as a as a consequence, they actually do have this more environmentally sustainable features. So. If you think about that Tesla's positioning and how that worked in the market, uh, maybe we can think of how to position sustainable products slightly differently. That's interesting. That's interesting. And uh, it's going it's going to cause me to be thinking about this long after our interview, Yewan. Yewan, thank you so much uh, for talking with us today. Uh, and uh, uh, for you listeners, if you want more information, about uh, Professor Yewan Kim's recent conference on marketing for environmental sustainability. You'll see it on uh, the webpage associated with the Stanford Initiative on Business and Environmental Sustainability. And so uh, for Yewan Kim and for myself, Bill Barnett, until next time. The Stanford Initiative on Business and Environmental Sustainability podcast series is sponsored by the Stanford Graduate School of Business and the Stanford Door School of Sustainability. Music by Charged Particles. That's Caleb Hutzler, Mike Rock, and John Krosnick.